Thank you. Good afternoon. Uh, my name is Rahul Merotra. I'm the chair of the Department of Urban Planning and Design, and I'm delighted to be welcoming you uh, to this afternoon session, the second session, actually not the afternoon, but the second session uh, for the Green Prize, um, the workshop in recognition of the Grand Paris Express, uh, reconfiguring the city through radical infrastructure. And it's an absolute pleasure to have you all here to celebrate this and to recognize and congratulate you on this wonderful project. I, I'm going to quickly just make three or four comments and then hand it over to Jack for the first intervention and then the panels. The first is, you know, is a reminder that in an institute like the Graduate School of Design where Louis Sert introduced the idea of urban design and as our colleague Eve Blau reminded us yesterday, urban design as a bridge practice, one that is necessarily about collaboration and has at its heart the kind of intention of spatial resolution for the multiple contesting forces that really mold our cities. And so this idea of the bridge practice, the idea of a practice that works across scales, across collaborations, and again, I think this project that we are celebrating today uh, really is uh, emblematic of that kind of definition. But naturally, urban design also has evolved, and as cities change and the issues we grapple with shift, urban design must recalibrate itself and its agency to ensure the spatial quality and form of our cities, and more importantly, anticipating the future in terms of the form of the city and the form that the city will take. And again, this project is anticipatory in nature and in ambition. And so this is, of course, not only the form it will take in, in terms of the built environment, but spatially within the larger territory. And again, here, this project uh, forces us to rethink not only the agency of urban design, but the way it can reimagine the territory that is so brilliantly done in these projections. The second point I'd like to make is the idea of how infrastructure has been deployed in this project to create a new imagination of the metropolitan area, of turning, I think in somebody's words yesterday, I think it was Kareem, uh, turning Paris inside out in some ways through radical infrastructure. The periphery, the metropolitan, shifting the gaze, but also the investments uh, and the energy, intellectual, creative, political, uh, to the connection with the hinterland. And I think that sort of ambition is quite mind-boggling. And I think it is this ambition that clearly the prize I believe is recognizing more than anything. A recognition of the ambition to not only work at the scales, to weave together a large region, but also to calibrate how what is really a top-down project is also sensitive on how these interventions might land on the ground and underground in some cases. The third point I'd like to make is the brilliance with which mobility has been calibrated and leveraged in this project. You know, the way at least I like to think about it is that cities are sort of about a holy trinity of livelihoods, dwelling, and mobility, with the fourth leg perhaps an important one, which is amenities. So mobility is the critical one that creates these relationships between livelihoods and dwelling. Dwelling, we call it housing often. And amenities ride on this. And amenities are also very critical because infrastructure is sometimes a singularly, is, is imagined in very singular terms. But when you nuance infrastructure, I think one begins to uh, actually get uh, a much more robust system, so to speak. And I think one of the things that are lacking in our discussions is the notion of distributional infrastructure, infrastructure that also creates distributions. I would give an example, child care infrastructure is a critical one. It allows uh, it allows benefits to be distributed in a completely different way. And what's amazing about this project is the physical infrastructure here is imagined and embedded in a way that it can create the framework for other forms of distributional uh, infrastructure, social infrastructure across the whole spectrum that might evolve with time. And so that becomes also emblematic of an incredibly creative way to imagine infrastructure and what its implications might be. And so this trinity, together with amenities, is something that allows access, it allows forms of equity. Uh, and this sort of critical social dimension that the project has addressed, sometimes explicitly and sometimes implicitly, is something I think over time we will see the benefits. 
So in short, I think the award is recognizing a project of great ambition, a project that makes us rethink another dimension of what urban design could be in terms of this bridge practice, in this case, synthesizing great complexity within the territory. And of course, this is precisely what makes it extremely political. It is a political project, as Kareem reminded us in the evening event in the Piper Auditorium. It's political in terms of the resources that are deployed. It's polit political in terms of the constitution that connect in terms of the benefits. So it has many dimensions that make it uh, political. And so I'd really like to congratulate the winners, wish you luck in how this is implemented, because finally the implementation on the ground is the critical thing. And actually, you know, just an aside, it's very unusual in the history of the, of the Green Prize uh, to award a project that doesn't have a 10-year durée in terms of reflection on the ground. Uh, and I think here the, the jury is placing fantastic bets on this project, uh, but through very rigorous analysis, uh, because its effects are already beginning to be felt, and one can discern some of that feedback. And so I think this makes it very critical in the way you've been inclusive in terms of stakeholders, designers, artists, um, as someone called it, the army that have been involved in making the project uh, actually happen. And lastly, I want to just close with uh, a sort of an informational announcement uh, that, you know, the Green Prize in its history, uh, we had an interruption because of the pandemic. Uh, and one of the ideas we came up with, uh, with support from the donors too, is to create an archive. And so we use the interrupted year to create an archive. Uh, it's called an urban design case study archive, which is a collaboration between the Urban Planning and Design Department and the Francis Loeb Library. And the goal of this archive is to support the study of the built environment in urban areas by developing a data-rich digital archive for urban design projects and related materials, drawings, photographs, texts, interviews, uh, you know, journal uh, 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 articles, but also what ha appears in the press. Uh, and we are starting with the archive of the Green Prize. Uh, the library will be able to be used as a teaching research resource on specific urban design projects. It becomes a resource of people writing cases uh, on these for the GSD community, but also beyond. It's going to be an open source, uh, and uh, it's a platform that will be open for anyone who's interested in research and teaching. And for us, this project is going to be something that's going to be really a living archive, because it will. It, the idea of, the, of this archive is that it gets built on every year. We are going back to projects that were awarded 20 years ago to see how they've weathered, what has happened, have they changed. And so so this process, I think, will set a, a wonderful precedent, and we're very thrilled uh, that this project will be part of that archive right away. And so to kick off this afternoon, uh, we are going to, again, have the structure where we'll have an introductory provocation, the first one by Jack here, uh, and then we'll have the panel discussions, and again, a key introduction by Pierre Emmanuel, uh, and then a panel discussion. So with that, I'm going to invite Jack, and let's kick off the afternoon. Afternoon. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you, Raoul. Today we, we are discussing about uh, infrastru infrastructure, and obviously when we talk about infrastructure, we, we talk about uh, cities. I would say that the problem is that in most places of the world, this could be, say, the other way around is that when you discuss about cities, in fact, you discuss about infrastructure. Because in most of the places of the, of the world, it seems that technology design has the lead, is the lead designer of a city. More than urban planner, more than politician, let alone the inhabitants. In a way, technology from being a servant is very often, or maybe too often, the master of our uh, urban design. And this is particularly true for infrastructure dedicated to transportation, because you also have the water, the energy, communication, so if the digital infrastructure. But the most visible uh, proof of this uh, power of technology is definitely infrastructure of transportation. Just to go back, I think we have to keep in mind, 
in this relationship very, very important between people, technology, and urban or architectural design. We have to keep in mind that at the very beginning of the cities, of a Western city at least, the nature was hostile and previsible, and that technology was mobilized, was required to create a protective uh, environment for the commercial, for the political, for the culture, all the achievements of the humanist, uh, the humanist society. I say that because sometimes when you talk about this relationship between technique and architecture, it seems that ah, you want to go back to something, to go back to a lost paradise where there was the city and the technology. It's not true. When we want to take the lead as architects, as politicians, on technology, it's in fact about innovation, because it never happened before. Always, the technology was the, we have to remind the Descartes, l'homme, uh, maître et possesseur de la nature, the man as the owner and the master of nature. The technology, in a way, is in the genetic code of the city. So that's, uh, that's one of the points I wanted um, uh, to, to make, to reconsider the situation as we did with the uh, Grand Paris uh, Express. So we talk uh, about the experience of people, and the experience of a city is definitely the experience of infrastructure. And again, the infrastructure of transportation has not only an influence about space, but about time, which is obviously very, uh, very important when the injunction to move is part of uh, our city life, at the point that you can see that the condition, the human condition in big cities is to be constantly uh, in, uh, in the movement. And this creates a relationship between people, between the body of a citizen and the environment, which is a very, uh, that creates a sort of anxiety. Because there are paradox like, one of them is this one, is that in this liquid society, uh, Everything, every space is seen as an obstacle to mobility and to the use of time. And at the same time, uh, you have so many obstacles that you see that it's uh, to us to get adapted to the technique and to the machine and not the contrary. So our gest gestures are conditioned uh, by this. Obviously, this is part of the basis of what we asked with uh, of a brief with um, uh, the station. So to, to summarize that, you, you could say that we became not the subject, but the object of technology. And transportation, very often, is like transporting, transporting people, transporting bodies, is like managing parcels and uh, transporting uh, objects. So one of the, one of the stop to, to this is, is given, obviously, by the climate uh, crisis. And we're all going through that now and talking about the footprint of CO2, et cetera, et cetera. This is obviously the, the most important part. But what we, we did with our guidelines, with uh, Pauline Marchetti, is to try not to reduce the environmental performances to over technical performances. Because to achieve a sustainable goal could be seen as an over technical achievement. When for us, is also to reconsider the relationship that we have with the city, the relationship that we have with the transport, the relationship that we have with the time we spend uh, in moving in the city. Something which is more and more important since it has been in the last panel, it has been a little discussed about the digital infrastructure. We see definitely another infrastructure. And I'm not going to explain that because it's more like an intuition, but this digital infrastructure, I think, is very more related to transport infrastructure in the way that we experiment the city. So we have to be very careful because it gives a sort of extra power to this idea of 
the infrastructure is above the city. When we want to see the city uh, first and uh, the infrastructure. So just to, to end this introduction, uh, I wouldn't uh, no, I would not like to be misunderstood about the city and to be critic, crit, uh, a critic of the city because we have every day 200, uh, 240,000 people more to house in this planet. 360,000 births and 120,000 uh, uh, deaths. So that's the size of the problem. And we know, depending on the criteria, that the cities, they use 4% of the usable land, once you have taken, obviously, the water, the mountain, etc. Only 4% of the usable land to house now 60% of the population. That means that the city is the problem. 50, Antoine is not, no, no. 50, 60 percent of the of Earth population. That means that if the cities, in terms of CO2 resources, etc., are the problem, they have to be the solution. We can't get away from the city. So the issue that we are discussing today about transporting trans transportation of so many people is a critical issue, obviously, uh, for this respect. And uh, our, uh, our work for the, for the Grand Paris was, uh, was inspired by this uh, thinking we have about the sensual city, which is about creating relations, saying that it's not architecture or urban de design, it's not just building or creating objects, but really thinking, maybe thinking first uh, to the relations and the links that these objects are going to, to create between themselves, obviously, but also with people, with a context, and with a climate. Now we have to go back to 2012. 2012, so more than 10 years ago. So when we won this uh, international competition with Pauline Marchetti to be the advisor of the uh, Société du Grand Paris, there was no architect. The, the engineering project was already launched, but there was no architect. So it was remarkable for the Société du Grand Paris to start to think about architecture, urban planning, four or five years before the, archi the actual architectural competition for the station. That means that we had four to five years to think about the station without really designing project. And obviously, it has been said many times today, one of the first ideas was to see this infrastructure as modifying this very special uh, way that Paris is working with. It has been said two million people in the historical center and 12 million people in a sort of informal suburb with no real images. All the images, Notre Dame de Paris, Saint Chapelle, etc., Invalide, etc. You have dozens of images in the old Paris and you have 12 million inhabitants that are deprived. They say, I, I live there or that. Nobody knows exactly where it is. So this was a first. Uh, idea. So that's why we produce the, this drawing, as you see, where the white part in the center is actually Paris. And this is an image, a cartography of a sort of new city that is going to emerge. And this is the city of the Grand Paris Express. And in a way, the message of this image, too, was to say, now maybe all the investment, all the energy in the 10 years or 20 years to come in terms of public space, symbolic projects, uh, landscaping, etc., should be concentrated on this new city. Because in a way, the historical Paris, even if you stay 10 or to 15 years without doing anything, I mean, it works very well, it's, it's there. So you could say that the new city is this one, which is, again, which is going to be a sort of new center, sort of circle as a center, or also you could see it as a space between, because you still have a urban development outside uh, this circle. But this is an issue. And if you zoom 
in, the, in this drawing, you see these new neighborhoods that is going to create. We are talking about the 15-minute city, La Ville du Quart d'Heure. I'm not sure I agree exactly with this because it's a sort of limitation. But with the Grand Paris Express, it extends this notion. Because you have one train every two minutes, you have three to four minute trip. That means that the 15 minutes could expand to different stations. So we list many resources. So, I mean, if you leave two minutes walk of bike from one station, you have your own 15 minute circle, but also you can benefit of the 10 minutes, you, you are going to use six minutes to go next station, and then you still have five to six minutes circle to enjoy your library, your university, shopping, etc. So this, I think, is going to be also a specificity of uh, Grand Paris and then the, the inter uh, mobility. So as Pauline Marchetti said during the, the first panel, uh, one of the first decisions we, we did is that we are not going to ask the architect uh, like a franchising, like a, a shop to say all the stations are going to be round or blue or, or no. we say you are going to do your own architecture. But it's going to be all about the ambience and the atmosphere. That means that the feeling to be in the Grand Paris station is going to be given by the fact that the light, the sounds, the touch of the material, etc., is, is going to have a, such a quality that he's going to say, ah, is not the poor usual quality of an ordinary metro, metro station. There is a relationship with the senses, which is very important. So, and uh, for you, you have seen the work of Dominique in Ville Juif. I think it's his project embodies perfectly one way to address this question, uh, the question of, uh, of the senses. And so you have, uh, so we have to invent some drawings because we didn't want to make these guidelines as a sort of technocratic, as a text and regulation, etc. So we wanted to use different means of representation, model, drawing, axonometric, etc., in order to transmit to the architect recommendation without already defining the architectural project. But also, and uh, Pierre Emmanuel remember all this, uh, all this phase, all this stage, and also to, to take on board the engineers. At the very beginning, he, this drawing was also made for all the engineers who were already calculating the tunnel, etc. And it worked. It worked. That means that after some time, at the beginning, they were saying, what well, is a sort of decoration that we are. That the architects, OK, when they are going to come, they are going to decorate the station. <laughs> but thanks to that, thanks to this time that Société du Grand Paris gave to us, we had the time to make the engineers feel proud of doing, as it has been discussed, more than just an efficient transport system. Also, the attention to the déjà là, to the situation, the fiction, very useful. So we propose different characters, and then we invent stories in order to see the, to see the project through the eyes of, let's say, actual, even fictionous, but actual people. So it gives you a different approach to, uh, to decision and, and to space, so you have little story uh, like that. The importance, one of the last points, uh, the importance is the station as a public space. And this continuity, which, which is figured by this model, which was again done uh, 10 years ago, the continuity with the light, with the views, with the shops, with the services between city, platform, platform, and cities, and the, the work that Pierre Alain was uh, talking about, about the public space in front and around the station. Then, at the end, this is the, the chart, the guideline. There are more, maybe 50 recommendations uh, based on this idea uh, of senses, based on this idea of frugality, is where the aesthetics and the sense cross the sustainability. So with the concept of sobriety, which was 
discussed because some of my friends architects say, oh, but sobriety is a limitation. But they say, no, it's a way, it's a way to make some, some aesthetic which is going to last. And for a, for a station that you use daily, obviously, is something important. Among the recommendations, thresholds, very important. Space between, space between the public space and outside and inside, between the platform and different levels. And this transition, this space between, are not only spaces, but also you can work with the ambience like the light. So many recommendations like that. Last image. It's about the it's about the integration of people. I mean, probably one of the problem of the infrastructure and of technology is what you say to the average people: you are not expert. We are expert. We know about the sewage system. We know about the lighting system. We know about the transportation system, etc. Definitely, it's not to me to say that, but definitely, the Grand Paris Express since the beginning is not bit like that, to have been involved in many public uh, meetings at the beginning. And there also you cross the artistic jumelage, the artistic couple, because Pauline Marchetti and Thierry Boutonnier, as an artist, they implement this idea of l'arbre du Grand Paris. And l'arbre du Grand Paris is going to be the same Polonia that you are going to find in front of each station. I hope, Dominique, that you don't forget about the Polonia. And, uh, and the, the tree, in fact, is, uh, is raised, is grown by local, uh, local citizens. And so it's the opportunity to organize a sort of uh, celebrations, party, community meeting, uh, uh, waiting for the station uh, to come. Thank you very much. Hello, good afternoon. I'm Julien Perron, director of uh, urban development in uh, Société du Grand Paris. Very glad to be here. I, I do my best in English, so be, be kind with me. <laughs> uh, first of all, um, you should know that the, the story of, uh, of Société du Grand Paris, uh, we first dealt with tunnel and uh, stations. When I arrived uh, nine years ago in Société du Grand Paris, there were uh, 130 um, uh, people, uh, of us, and 130 people to build uh, 200, uh, 200 kilometers of subway, it's not so much. So uh, in uh, 2015 with Bernard, uh, we launched the program uh, with uh, Pierre Alain on mobility on public spaces. Um, that was called the uh, uh, Place of Grand Paris, Les Places du Grand Paris. Um, and uh, you, you describe it. In 2019, we relaunched uh, our uh, program uh, about uh, project uh, urban development around uh, stations of uh, Grand Paris Express. Uh, the Grand Paris Express was designed to serve the area with most of difficulties. Uh, the objective is to provide access to employment, to culture, to um, education, to uh, health equipment, uh, culture, and laser. We also wanted to create uh, stations. Pierre Emmanuel uh, told you, um, tell you uh, in the last part of this afternoon, uh, to create and to develop the identity of our territories, the lack of uh, identity. Uh, we didn't want to create only stairs in the sidewalks. We want to create uh, some buildings, and uh, it's, um, it's a very uh, important guideline for us. Our secret at Société du Grand Paris, I give you, <laughs> is uh, to discuss. We, we said it uh, most, uh, uh, several times this afternoon. It's crazy, but it's true. Uh, that's our uh, power, especially with uh, municipalities. Uh, we have to make specific answer, answer for each situation. We have only 68 situations, so we have to, uh, to, to deal with and to make uh, specific answers. It's not so much. It's easy. <laughs> we try to. Uh, with, the other, uh, with the other public uh, planning establishment, uh, we ensure that uh, planning at, uh, at the service of the municipalities. Uh, at the Société du Grand Paris, we don't have the greatest number of uh, properties, properties, Pierre Emmanuel, land properties, uh, but uh, they are well placed. 
very well placed around, the, around and upon the stations. Uh, it means uh, at the center of the districts. It's very important for us because it's not the, the, the biggest part, but it's the uh, well done part and the well placed part. Um, to succeed, we, uh, we must create together, which means uh, if, um, if we go alone, we will, um, we will not arrive uh, to, to our objectives. It's a longer path for us, but it's the most effective. Um, so, uh, what about our dynamics uh, upon the, 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 the urban development uh, around Grand Paris Express? We want to create as many housing as possible. It's orientation of the, the government, the state, and we agree, of course. Uh, but uh, since the COVID crisis, we are very um, acting carefully with uh, uh, activities uh, buildings, so uh, not so much in our programmation. I would like, to, uh, before ending, uh, to insist on two very important ideas for me uh, on my action in Société du Grand Paris. The Grand Paris Express will disrupt travel times totally. Um, we have no, not yet succeeded in explaining this to Grand, Great Parisian. Uh, what took uh, 45 minutes today will take three minutes tomorrow. It's a revolution. Um, and this, this revolution awaits us. The, the second idea, very important for me, in my conce conception of uh, the city, uh, public spaces must be, must be the center of all approaches. Uh, these are places of transit, but also place for break, service, and life. Uh, we are all pedestrian in our day, each day. In our station neighborhoods, we will articulate our stations, existing stations, all, all ancient, uh, ancient networks, the exist, existing cities uh, and uh, plain, plain cities, especially our, around public space, spaces. Finally, remember that Grand Paris Express is not a technical and architectural project or performance. This is a technique at the service of the people, urban projects to improve their lives. This is our commitment. Thank you. To the third session, um, I'll just start by introducing myself. My name is Christopher Ball. I'm a second year urban design student here at the GSD. I'm honored to be moderating this panel today on Metro Station and the Urban Context, Mobility Advancement Driving Diverse Public Realms. And I'd also like to thank again Dean Whiting, Professor Brusquets, Megan Octavani, and everyone who traveled here for the event. Prior to coming to the GSD, I worked as an architect for five years in uh, France, Switzerland, China, and the US, most recently at Bernard Schumi Architects in New York. It was while working at Bernard Schumi Architects where I first encountered the Grand Paris Express, where I worked on a project on the Paris Saclay campus directly across from one of the new stations to come. At the time, I was struck by the ambition of the project and the clear guidelines that the Société set up to ensure a vibrant public realm. I'll try to keep my introduction short so we can get to the panel. Um, I'll be joined on the panel by uh, Dominique Alva, um, Georges Legend, Diane Davis, and Gary Hildebrand. Um, Dominique Alba is an architect with almost 40 years of combined experience working in the public and private sectors in France. From 2012 to 2022, she was the general manager of the Atelier Parisien d'Urnisme, Apeur. Under her direction, the Apeur changed scales and now works on over 800 square kilometers in conjunction with more than 30 partners in Greater Paris. Following that experience, she was appointed the Chief Executive Officer of Atelier Jean Nouvelle in October 2022. Georges Legend is the professor in practice at the Harvard GSD. He's also the founding partner of IJP Architects, which is a London-based architecture practice, exploring the natural intersection between space, mathematics, and computation. He graduated from the GSD and taught at numerous schools, such as the ETH Zurich, Princeton University, and the AA before returning to the GSD. And the work of IJP has been profiled in more than 50, 50 publications and has won numerous awards. 
Diane Davis is the Charles Dyer Norton Professor of Regional Development and Urbanism and former chair of the Department of Urban Planning and Design at the Harvard GSD. Before coming to the GSD in 2011, Davis served as the head of the International Development Group in the Department of Urban Studies and Planning at MIT, where she was also associate dean of the School of Architecture and Planning. Trained as a sociologist, she teaches courses on spatial structure, social composition, and the governance of cities. And finally, uh, Gary Hildebrand is the Peter Lewis Hornbeck Professor of Practice in Landscape Architecture, and since 2022, the Chair of the Department of Landscape Architecture at Harvard GSD, where he's taught since 1990. He's also the founding principal of the renowned landscape architecture firm Reed Hildebrand, with offices in Cambridge, Massachusetts, and New Haven, Connecticut. His career and practice is motivated for his advocacy for urban forests and related innovations in the public realm. So I like to start off by asking um, Dominique to elaborate on how her work at APUR has intersected with planning for the Grand Paris Express. Uh, as has been mentioned many times, uh, the addition of 68 new stations holds the promise to kind of recenter the fragmented and diverse local contexts of the uh, peripheral Paris communities around these new metro stations and seeks to create new centers of civic life. So I'm curious, how are the various communities responding to this mandate? Has there been acceptance or resistance to the coming change? And what challenges exist in retrofitting these existing communities into new urban centers? Thank you. I prepared some slides for you. I just get up to see the slides. And it, won't be, it won't be long. Just to say, um, Apur, uh, so it's a town planning structure, so I think for you it could be interesting. It's a town planning structure, so, so for you it's quite interesting perhaps to know that it exists, and for all the students, you can go on the internet and look at all the documents. I think it can help you, and I say Jan Busquet this morning, it's uh, just a way to learn to look at things. So. <laughs> It's not to give solutions, but I understood that, in fact, in a non-specific in this moment, in a, the changes we have to face, to, to face uh, learning to look is something very important. So uh, this was the, the map for the Grand Paris Express. Uh, we, have, we had in Apur the idea to go and see the Société du Grand Paris and tell us that uh, we are in a very specific situation because we are in a case of reverse planification because they decided to do this metro, but in the planification documents, this event wasn't completely dis defined. So we, we went to, to see them. It was not Jean-Francois, it was 12 years ago. <laughs> and uh, we said that uh, perhaps we could try to work and to prepare something, and we create the observatory of the Quartier de Gare du Grand Paris. To do this observatory, the idea was to say, how are we able to have some common uh, information or indicators that all the people uh, accept, so the citizens and all the politics, and so we can just see what's going to happen and show also what is already there. And uh, we spent two years preparing the documents, and uh, in fact, when we presented that to the all the mayors of all the small territories, they said, OK, we agree. Because we were just showing for the first time positive things and negative things. And the target was to say, we, want to, we, we're, we, we can do that job, but we want it to be public. So it's for this period, it started in now, the observatory is now quite 10 years old. And he goes on, now he's changing, and we added and many things all the time, and I will just show you. So the idea was to show all the differences so that you have all the differences in all the quartiers de gare. So as you can see, some are totally built and some are totally green. But in fact, what we added to that, because APU is not only working with the Grand Paris Express, is to say that many things are, are going there, and you need to know that it's not only you doing things. 
you have many, many places where things are going on, and many people said during the panels that we have to be careful because things are not going always as we imagine they are going. And so this shows, for example, we have quite, we have more than 500 projects active today in the metropolis of the Great Paris, and we have more than 1,000 starting. And it's uh, more or less 32 million square meters in the perimeters of the Quartier de Gare. That means that you have a huge concurrency and a huge modifications everywhere. So we just, I will not comment everything, but just to, to show you what we, what we look at, Johan. And this also was to say, these modifications, they are in that territory where you have um, what is, as more is blue, as more is offices and work, and as more is uh, yellow and uh, orange, it's inhabitants. So as you can see, it's not very mixed. The only place that is mixed is more or less this spot. So that means that the Great Paris Express has also the opportunity to push not only perhaps the mixity, but as said Julien, with changing the mobility, you don't need to take the offices and to put them where you have inhabitants because nobody wants to do that. No investor is going to go with you. They will say no, no, no. But what you're going to do when you live here, now it's one hour and a half to go there. Tomorrow it will be 20 minutes. So it's changed everything. So you don't need to push the offices and the inhabitant. That's very expensive and has no, no efficiency, but you can do that. This is the accessibility Julien was speaking about. You know, as soon as it's brown, it's uh, more than, you reduce your time 150%. Another, another expression, this is the actual vision you have about culture. So this is traditional culture. As you can see, everything is in Paris and a little bit in Versailles. And uh, tomorrow, with the Great Paris Express, you're able to consider that culture is possible everywhere. Because we have it already, but nobody can go there. So with the Great Paris Express, you can just consider that, for example, here, it's going to be 20 minutes to, walk, to have from that place to that place. And you have many theaters, many sports equipments, many libraries. So also, you don't need to have more and more. OK. And uh, you just say it's here. So you don't need to build it. So the Great Paris Express also will help that. And it was very important to say that, because everybody says, we have a project, and now we have to have additional amenities. No, we have also the amenities. So we are very lucky. The only thing we have to do is to consider them together. That's something new. And this, and it, uh, it's quite finished, it's about the transport. Uh, Grand Paris Express is uh, something, but, so it told me that I could do something. Ah. So you, all, it's easier like that. All what is red, <laughs> all what is red. Please take is the mic for the people who are <coughs> online. Okay. If you okay. take the mic. Okay. Yeah. This, sorry, this shows all, all that is red, is now going on. So one, a part of it is the Great Paris Express, but I'm sorry, Jean-Francois, others are doing things, because he is using 30, 35 million euros, but we have 15 more that are made by SNCF, and by also all the people making tramway. And so all this will create not only these two uh, uh, rings, but all the network you, you were speaking about in, uh, in the, the other uh, panel. And this is very important because it allows people to think really differently. And our job is really to push that all time, each day, each day, each day, because it allows so many possibilities for the metropolis to be different, to be attractive. So we, we can't, how do you say, we can't miss that, uh, that, um, that moment. And uh, this, means that we're able, all those people in green, they are less than two kilometers from a metro station. Not tramway and bus, only metro station. That means that if you have tramway and buses, it's much shorter. That means that if you're able to have uh, sidewalks and uh, lanes for bicycles, you can do everything by bicycle. Because two kilometers is really very, very short. 
And we have not very high mountains in the Great Paris. We have a part where you have to climb, but now you have electric bicycles. And the COVID period was very uh, useful for that because everybody decided to create RER, that's the name of our Réseau de Transport Express, RER for bicycles. So now it's going on. And I would like just to finish with a walk. Because uh, a nice city is a city where you like to walk. And uh, Société du Grand Paris, with uh, Enlarge Your Paris, it's a young team of uh, journalists, they created this and they helped to say, we now have to walk, so they are pushed by the Société du Grand Paris. And also Apur helped them with the maps. And with uh, Pierre-Emmanuel and uh, Julien, we were uh, completely supporting them. And uh, this is just to show you, this one was the, I think it was the, la the one that was made uh, not last summer, but uh, the summer before. And all those with small hearts are the places the people decided to love. So as you can see, there's many. And it's walking. And it's, at this moment, we still don't have sky, uh, sidewalks everywhere. So we, we walk in special conditions. And so it's 200 kilometers promenade each summer, meaning that perhaps if we do that, we can create what you were asking me to answer, the conditions for the people to be uh, in, a, in a nice, uh, have a nice way of life. So we call it the pedestrian metropolis. Perhaps it's ambitious, but I think it's possible. So it's finished. Thank you for that. Um, I guess I'll go to Gary next and ask um, what design opportunities um, around these stations um, exist for improving the public realm uh, with kind of the reconfiguration of these uh, communities around these new stations? And um, how will the cities and towns, uh, how should they maximize this opportunity? Thanks, Chris, for the question. Um, thanks for bringing us finally to the ground of the 68 new city centers or revitalized centers. One of the things we learned on our visit on the jury, which hasn't quite been articulated yet, is that we don't have 68 stations. We have 68 gars. The gar links the project to a historical type which is crucial for Paris. It's more than a station, way more than a station, right? So this is radical mobility, uh, and I want to just make one observation, a uh, historical observation. I'm not a historian, so you'll forgive me. Um, you know, the origins of the Paris train system and the boulevards that link them, the Elsman, Paris that we know, created a new public realm that was unlike any in the world. And I think this is one of the very things that propelled Paris to be a cultural center for the world and a model. This can happen now. I think, so if you live in the Bagne, you don't own a Gare du Nord, Gare de Lay, Gare Saint-Lazare. But now you will. And this changes people's lives and changes the identity of their center. Second point is the implication uh, for the Grand Prix Express on mobility in the metropolis. Less cars, fewer cars, fewer single driver trips. What does the implication mean? It means we have more space for pedestrian public realm. This is crucial. Um, pedestrian public realm, I noted in your presentation that in the center, pedestrian um, mode of mobility is the, is, the, is the top choice in the center. This can now be extended to 68 centers. So I think this is really quite profound for, you know, an implication for each of these gars and their um, related public realm. Third point is about the quality 
and the inclusiveness that's intended in these revised public realms, or in some cases, brand new public realms. And I'm referring here to a bit of uh, Pierre Alain's talk, but also um, to the guidance that was provided for the archipelago metropolis to the design teams by Jacques Feuillet and, uh, and Pauline. This, um, I, I was just incredibly struck. I, I know my colleagues on the jury were as well at the use of the words emotion, sensibility, sensuosity, humility, and the everyday. Uh, this was the guidance to the teams. Let me quote something you haven't heard quite in this way. The design teams are orchestrating an intuitive and sensible journey. This is fantastic. It's like phenomenology is here again, guiding design. That's, for, for me, that's uh, irreplaceable. It allows us to, in a way, rethink the code of the surface of the city with the familiar, but reconfigured, and maybe even with a new vocabulary. So this is Camille Pissarro's 1893 statement of modernity in Paris. This is the modern city for Pissarro, 1893. Can we go to that? And by the way, a little bit of chaos, undifferentiated, but a convening place for every kind of activity in the city. And this brings with it hotels, commercial activity, residential, visitors, movement of goods. That creates the vital 19th century and early 20th century city. Next slide, please. Thanks, Chris. Very soon after, this is only you know, less than a decade later, 1900, same view, maybe from the same hotel you begin to see the differentiation of the surface. There has to be a place for the streetcar, and then there has to be a refuge for the pedestrian. So we begin to stratify, horizontally stratify, the space of the street and the space of the gar. For 100 years, we have made the space for cars and trucks and service vehicles and buses the priority, but that's not happening any longer. And in my career, I have seen the switch, and you are also in these 68 city centers, hopefully, hopefully, rewiring that code and devoting more space to the pedestrian life of the city, to the sensible. You don't get the sensible in, in the car, you get it in walking. Dominic just made a, be a beautiful statement about that. My last point is that in this increase of public realms times 68, the city has the power, the metropolis has the power to increase environmental benefits for everyone. More places for shade. I have devoted a lot of my career, as Chris mentioned, to this, to this matter. If we are going to have 50 degree summers, we need trees, a lot of trees. <laughs> and the expansion of the canopy is a vital part of this project. And uh, we, all, we have to be very thankful for that. It is also the ability to make the city more permeable, vertically, sectionally, and also planimetrically. Um, and in doing so, we create, I think, the resilient space of appearance for the future. Thank you. Thanks, Gary. Um, just, I guess, I'll conclude with one last question for Diane and George. Um, you know, France, as we've seen, is a country with a long history of urban design initiatives and using design um, as a driver. Um, one example is many uh, President Mitterrand's initiatives in the 80s. Um, and I think some of these initiatives have sought to combat 
social exclusion in the periphery communities, and yet we see that these problems kind of continue to occur. Um, and you know, equity, as we've heard before, is a major component of the Grand Paris Express. Uh, how can we as designers and planners design for equity um, to help ensure a vibrant public realm? Um, thanks for that question. And I'm going to share just a few brief thoughts. I see we're already running out of time here. And everything is so powerful on this, um, on this panel. I loved, I loved your presentation. It's already helping me answer some of the questions I want to share with all of you. But let me just say that I'd like to situate, and also Gary's presentation as well, I, I want to suggest that we situate our thinking about equity in a geographical and territorial as well as political context. And even though this panel is called the metro station and the urban context, I'm interested in the urban context, but I want to think about it on multiple scales at the same time. There is a bit of a um, bias in my discipline of urban planning to always look local right around the station, but I want us to be thinking about the larger territory, which you've done so well, Dominique, in your presentation. So the first thing is I would say that if we understand the beauty of this, the promise of this project as offering a new territoriality of the metropole, we should recognize that that project is a product of national, regional, and urban interactions and political fights that were inspired in part by some of those problems back in a couple decades ago. So um, everybody in the team here knows, I don't know if everybody here, the GST, it, it, when we, we could go back to Sarkozy and the competition about Grand Paris region, there was a, his team working for the national government had a image, the, the what was it called, the, the Grand Eight. I mean, there was a design configuration and then there was a more, radical proposal coming from the regions, the suburbs, the Grand Arc. There were different understandings of the territoriality that were really driven by a conflict between maybe an equity question versus international competitiveness. Paris as you know a competitive city that was going to beat out London, etc. There's a new version now, but we have to understand where are these ideas coming from that provided the network that you're working with. And not forget that when we think about how we're going to, you, we, you are going to activate those stations in order to address the equity questions. So, um, I, I, so the historical understanding of how this got to be the network is important. It's not just the past. It should be part of the conversation about the present. The second thing that I would suggest is that you ask or we ask, we consider in that assemblage of these political actors at different territorialities, they have different desires for these projects and for these stations. The national state regional authorities, you have your own authority, localities will have different views, and every one of those 68 places will have a different understanding based on who lives there, what is their constituency. So again, it complicates the question of equity. I'm not saying that you couldn't have a community meeting and deal with it at one place, but I want us to, one, to ask ourselves whether it's possible to think about the entire network and how the combination of what happens at the 68 stations is part of the equity project. So that leads me to my kind of my last point, maybe my, my penultimate point, is and it builds on some of the conversation in the earlier panels. We and we all have our use of language differently depending on our discipline, depending on our nationality. But I think there's been a little tension in in productive tension in the in the in our conversation between the notion of infrastructure versus the notion of network. And the, the concept of infrastructure has been used a lot to talk about the mobility infrastructure. In the last panel, Carol mentioned, she used the concept of network, but she was really talking about a mobility network. She expanded it in, in, uh, in a response to one of the questions. I, would I think it's important to think about it as a network and not as an infrastructure, and to expand our understanding of that network to be something like a livelihood network, well, Rahul mentioned that at the beginning, or a livability network, or shall we say an inclusive urbanism network. Because that means there's the parts and the whole, and you can never only look at the network as a mobility network 
and you can't only look at one station. You have to understand what is, there. now that makes your job more difficult because you have all those conversations and meetings and not enough people to talk 68. So what does that mean? Thinking about stations as activators for an entire network and not just for the locality. And that means questions about what gets where are really important because some of those neighborhoods don't have anything and some have a lot of things. And how do you balance that in the network as a whole. So what, how would I end? I would say that suggest to think about something like a, I'm a planner, so a collective network discussion. It's not enough just to have the discussion at the station. It, you need to think about new assemblages of kind of deliberation that you constantly are reminding that you're all part of the Grand Paris everybody who gets involved in that conversation. And I think that that will, and that will allow, I, another thing that I've heard and, and, and listened to in the, today is this discussion of centering versus decentering. We're moving beyond that conversation. It's not centering versus decentering. It's a new collective assemblage that is produced, the phenomenological point, produced through pr participatory processes, but through the decision of what exactly gets in those stations. So I'll stop there. Uh, Anything to add, George? Thank you. Yeah, it looks like I'm going to conclude, which is just as well, because I am uh, in agreement with everyone. <laughs> but I would like to see this. I just have four slides, really. I just want to run very, very quickly for them without spoiling the uh, the pleasure. I took the invitation to sit on this panel simply uh, um, to contribute the idea of, uh, like, what is the Quartier de la Gare then? You know, just literally try to answer the question very, very quickly. So, of course, you can't address the question without just looking at, well, I guess, the, the backdrop. Um, I mean, it is a political project and a, and a very long standing one, as you mentioned, um, which hasn't always run smoothly, as you can see on the picture. Um, in essence, what the banlieue needs is, is social mobility, no? I mean, it needs employment, um, practical training, it needs education, it needs childcare for working parents. Um, but architecture and urban design have a role to play too, and I think it's one of the original promoters of Banlieue 89 who said something to the effect that, you know, my translation, that the derelict backdrop does not create poverty or social deprivation, but poverty and social deprivation will invariably home in on it. So, if we look at the next slide, what is then, um, the public place. Well, you know, I can't speak on behalf of the North American paradigm because I live in rural East Anglia in the United Kingdom, but I do know the, um, what the French call the Anglo-Saxon model, um, what it thinks, uh, which is that public space is essentially retail, um, as you can see in the, uh, this picture of the recent renovation of the Eurostar Hub in London, in which I think the planners regard public space as little more than a huge duty-free, uh, except for the prices, which are obviously <laughs> twice as high as anywhere else. Um, so the 20 odd brands that make up the London High Street are simply rearranged into an arcade uh, and, and that is it effectively. So that concentration, for instance, has like a zero impact on the neighborhood. Compared to, for instance, just between the two buildings, the original King's Cross and the new redevelopment of, of St. Pancras, that informal esplanade actually is both memorable and extremely practical. So if you ask me for my money, if we look at the next slide, um, if I just try to think super quickly of the two, three cities that I lived and worked with for a very short time, um, so Zurich or Stuttgart, I'd say what I remember of them pri primarily is the Quartier de la Gare. So why? Well, that's Zurich. Often it's very central, so you can't miss it. You have to go through it you know, four or five times a day. Sometimes it's beautiful, as is the case now here, not always. The, the building is generally memorable, but not necessarily so either. And then, of course, there's a lovely esplanade, which is typically pedestrianized. And of course, you sometimes have the affordable, the odd affordable brasserie that you can patronize even though we're not traveling. So um, that is generally what I would think then what public space might be, if I look at it simply for the uh, say standpoint of the, the, the visitor. Um, a lovely pedestrian space that will effectively make the most of what I think befells every community that gets a transit um, uh, hub, which is that it will be in the path of crowds. So that means both um, footfall for retail, but also everyone who actually depends on footfall to uh, live or thrive or even survive, like anything from panhandles to drug users will be there. And that too needs to be somehow addressed. But 
my dream, and that's a concluding slide, is if it could be something not actually exactly like this, but what this was 30 years ago when I was uh, a teenager in Paris, which is actually a really thriving esplanade, and not what you see the last 10 years, which is this complete emptiness that points to some kind of problem in sustaining that model of public space in Paris, even in the middle of, of such a central area, which is, you know, has such, such affluence. So even though the omens are not terribly good, I think it's important to insist and uh, consider this particular sort of paradigm of public space as, as you know, the aim to achieve. And on this note, I thank you for your uh, attention. Thank you. All right, thank you everyone. I think that concludes our panel.